let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today for our uh, quarter three open source support U portal update. Uh, so today uh, what we're gonna do is pretty much go over uh, and provide you some of the findings that we've had from troubleshooting your tickets and from our sustainable engineering work over the year so far. Uh, we'll also go ahead and highlight anything of note that we've heard about throughout the community. Uh, but first, what I want to do is go ahead and introduce you to your Unicon uPortal team. So there's a new face up there that you'll see, and that is mine, of course. Uh, my name is Brandon Menard, and I'm the new program manager for uPortal Open Source Support. Uh, my role here is basically just to kind of help maintain uh, the quality and consistency of the services that we provide to you. Uh, so I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. Uh, next person you see here, obviously probably doesn't need much introduction, as I'm sure you all have uh, know a lot about Benito Gonzalez already, but he is your technical account manager for uPortal. Uh, he's pretty much our resident guru when it comes to uPortal. So uh, as we go through a lot, of the, a lot of the information today, you guys will see that firsthand. Uh, and then finally, we also have Chris Beach, who is basically Benito's right-hand guy right now on uPortal. Uh, Chris uh, actually recently attended the Open Apparel Conference and is also forecasted to do a lot of the quarter four sustainable engineering work on uPortal. So he's, uh, he's definitely a good resource as well. All right, so the agenda for today will be uh, basically to go through some of these items here. Uh, we're going to start with some layout examples, uh, some highlights from Dev Days, as well as the Apparel Conference. Uh, talk a little bit about COVID-19. Obviously, that's a, that's a big thing going on right now. We're also going to go through some of the web component and uh, enhancements that uPortal has been utilizing and, and how we can sort of use them for you. A little bit about our roadmap as we move forward, um, some of the sustainable engineering updates, and then, of course, that Q&A like I talked about. All right, so first things first, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uPortal layout examples. So uh, one of the things we hear a lot is just that the uPortal um, look tends to be a little bit static, a little bit kind of stagnant, stodgy, almost kind of old in stylization. Uh, and so one of the things we wanted to do is kind of walk through a little bit about how these layouts have really improved and how even web components can make them get very stylized and customized as we move forward. So you don't always have to jump into the code when it comes to being able to stylize this web component work, which we'll get into more detail later. Uh, we'll be able to really kind of help you out with that. So let's go ahead and start with one of the more classic looks of the layouts that we're used to. So here's one that you guys have probably seen a lot. It's got your basic three column setup uh, kind of walks through, uh, tabs down the middle, um, pretty standard look as far as a U portal will go. Then moving on to one that's a little bit more stylized, uh, still kind of a standard classic look, but obviously uh, a little bit more style and how, how it looks. You've got waffle menu, you've got uh, more of a modern look uh, with some basic web components that have been added in. So uh, you can start to see how this definitely changes the direction and the look of a portal at this point. Now, this is a really great example of what you can do with web components. So what we actually did here was basically do kind of like a mock-up of Netflix, essentially, right? So you've got a big front banner picture. You've got uh, smaller smaller items down here that kind of lead you to, uh, along with the scroll bar that you can kind of walk through the different images. Very similar to what you see on Netflix. So give you an idea about how stylized this can get, especially as we start to add in web components. And as we move on to this, you can actually see what a portal uh, can actually look like when you leverage several web components. So uh, in the upper right, you can actually see we've got a hamburger menu. We've got uh, over, I'm sorry, the upper left, we've got the hamburger menu. We've got a waffle over to the right. Uh, we've also got some content in the middle that is, to, that is connected via web components. And then this one I feel like is a really kind of modern, uh, almost kind of 
even in some ways kind of app style look of what you can do with uh, building web components. So this is what I call the web component inception, basically using web components to build web components inside of a portal. So this one I feel like is kind of the, the um, kind of top tier look of, of adding web components into your portal. All right. And so from here, what I'm going to do is go ahead and hand it over to Benito. We'll let him talk a little bit about some of the Dev Days highlights from his time on Dev Days. Hey, good uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, folks. Um, just want to uh, kind of highlight what we did at Dev Days this past year. And in fact, I was just thinking that we really didn't cover Dev Days 2019. So I'll go through uh, the next slide and talk about uh, Dev Days from earlier this year. And if we're not pressed for too much time, I might at least touch on um, Dev Days from 2019. So next slide. The interesting thing about Dev Days is that uh, we tried to join one of the other Aperio projects who have their dev days in, in Orlando, Florida. They specifically choose Orlando uh, because of all the theme parks nearby. So those of us who attended, uh, while we weren't jumping on rides or anything, we certainly were able to enjoy the venue, um, uh, go out, and there was a lot of great food and a lot of things to do in the evenings. But during the day, boy, were we busy. Um, we had a lot of things going on. We covered a lot of topics. Attendance was uh, really low. We kind of knew it was going to be low, but we had a lot of, of folks, um, some of you on the call here, join for several sessions, and that really added to the experience. <clears throat> so um, if you couldn't be there live, uh, joining in over Zoom really helped everyone kind of um, get more from those sessions. Uh, Monday, we kind of had a slow ramp up. We, we talked about uh, uPortal and Fiosin. Um, we were just going over kind of the direction and, and uh, what the roadmap might look like. We were just throwing out a couple ideas and kind of getting warmed up. Um, <clears throat> actually, give me a second here. Um, so the uh, the Fiosin topic is where we ta uh, jumped into the notifications hub. So this is something that Edinburgh has um, contributed, is in the middle of incubating at the Aperio Foundation. It's a notification system where various uh, services can uh, submit notifications. There's also a UI. And then with that uh, notification hub, information or notifications can be sent uh, via text, email, and also send messages into the uPortal notification system, which can be displayed in, in several manners. Um, <clears throat> there's the default where it just shows up in the notification list, but a lot of times these are important notifications as well, such as emergency alerts. And so there are a couple of different ways to display that in the portal, such as through a banner, or through a modal dialogue. Um, and Chris will touch on that when we start talking about um, the notification web components. Uh, of course, web components, you're gonna hear this over and over again. Uh, we we kind of just really embraced web components. Well, we started with web components about two, two and a half years ago. Uh, we had some issues, especially around IE compatibility but as we worked through all those things and all the pieces started falling in, in place, web components really took off. Uh, so we'll be focusing on that in this discussion. And the key thing here is we get a lot of flexibility. We get a lot of modern looking content and, you're, and there's no code involved. It's configuration. Sure, we, need to, we might need to enhance a web component, but even when we work on web components versus portlets or server-side code, the cycle for development is fast. We can make code changes, refresh our browser, and see the changes on the web component. That leaves a lot of things on the server side, kind of focused on just getting data from different sources and massaging it into a certain format. 
um, you know, and, and of course following business rules. So that's the really nice thing is front end development styling, how to present that is centralized in web components, the business logic of what we're getting and what we're gonna send over to the front end, front end being the browser, um, can happen in the back end um, in Java usually. Uh, we did talk about upgrading your portal five. I, I will cover a session on that, what it looks like. Uh, what we've tried to do with uPortal is semantic versioning. Um, it's also called SEMBER, you know, an abbreviated uh, term for that. And what that means is if the first number in the version changes, it means there is an incompatibility change and you probably need to go through some big hoops to, to do an upgrade. With the minor version, the second number, as that increments, it means a new feature has been added to the project, but is backwards compatible. And then the third number is kind of the debug number. So those are just, um, if that increments, it means bug fixes have been put into the system. That all being said, because uPortal is pretty complicated, um, while we really try to adhere to that, there were some issues with upgrading between 4.3 and 4.4 and 5.5 to 5.7 in, in those ranges. Nothing major, just some changes needed to be applied to uPortal Start. If you're not familiar with uPortal 5, um, it now uses uPortal Start to uh, collect all your configuration information, um, customizations, and uh, your skins. Um, so there is some tooling around that, and that tooling does need to be adjusted every once in a while, such as between uPortal 4, I think it was 5.3 and 5.4, where two deprecated modules were finally removed. So the scripts um, that reference those needed to, to be updated. So if you've just incremented your uPortal version number and your uPortal start um, in that Air, that zone in that range, um, then you may have run into some issues. So I covered a couple of those things um, in that presentation. And then <clears throat> with uh, two attendees there um, from Texas A&M, Stephen Ragusa, and um, we also had um, Andre, and I'm not gonna pronounce his last name, but from Brooklyn. And we spent a lot of time going over some of their issues, working through some of their problems um with with uh just just minor minor uh bugs or configuration issues we, we needed to work through so that was a nice afternoon um moving on to tuesday uh we talked about the portlet dashboards it was a a boff you know birds of a feather feather essentially an open discussion and really the the thing that uh popped out to me was that dashboards are a very flat view for the users, where a portal can have a lot of information, lots of tabs, and a user may need to drill down and explore to find the information. A dashboard is, is more lightweight and the information is more dynamic. Um, but a uPortal can fulfill uh, you know, that description easily. It's just about putting the content and organizing it in such a way. So that was the focus there uh, around portal to dashboards. And also a little bit about marketing, the idea that the word portal <coughs> might be getting long in the tooth and dashboards were kind of a more modern buzzword. So was, you know, we, there was some discussion on, on maybe a, a name change, uh, but we didn't get too far. Uh, web component styling talked about how there is um, a, a new way to, to get style into a web component that's driven from outside of it. One of the tenets of web components is that it's isolated and styling does not usually get into or affect the, the styling inside of a web component. However, in a portal and in other app, you know, applications, that's actually desired. So there's a couple of, of changes in web component specs that allow for um, styling to, to um, drive into these web components. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, that was not one that I led. That was very much a student in that session. 
We talked about web component intercommunication. The key here is that with so many web components, there is sometimes a need for web components to uh, send messages or events to other web components. Um, currently, we really like Vue as the framework for our web components, although web components are available in React, Angular, and other frameworks. Um, so kind of the, the focus here in this topic was that if you're, if you're um, focused solely on a particular framework and you don't need to talk to maybe the um, uPortal basic web components, you could use whatever intercommunication um, feature set is available in your framework. However, if you do want to allow participation of web components from outside um, your, your framework, then falling back to the Windows events, which that's been around for almost two decades. Well, a very long time. Um, and oh, I showed his demo of using that um, around the category selector and the ESCO content grid. Moving on to OIDC, that stands for Open ID Connect. While we don't have a full featured um, OIDC implementation in uPortal, we, we have something that is very much compatible with that using um, JavaScript web tokens. <clears throat> and so we have some components, both uh, web component um, code and server side code to facilitate using OIDC uh, to secure API endpoints. Uh, and the basic uh, process there is that a web component will talk to uPortal, hit an API to get the user's uh, ticket or token, and that token is signed and encrypted by uPortal. And then when that web component wants to access another API endpoint, such as the notifications um, API, it passes this JWT with the user information. That API endpoint goes, looks at that, uh, shares the secret with you portal of, of how it's being, of the key that's used for the signature, verifies that it can unencrypt and that it was signed with that key. So that says, yes, this token is from you portal. And now inside of that token, you can pull out the user's name, some attributes and group information. Um, and then, uh, then provide the, the response, knowing that you, um, that web component represents that user. So it was really focused on security. It might've got a little technical, but it was, um, I think uh, people appreciate hearing at least a high level and then in some detail what's going on. And there was a, a couple links there as well and some examples. Uh, uPortal APIs, we touched on some of the new APIs and what we'd like to see coming up. Um, and then uh, we just brushed microservices, essentially microservices really we're talking about APIs that the web components need to talk to. Um, and you can define something using servlets. Um, the Soffit technology is one way to do it, although you don't need to leverage all of that. You can just put in a servlet, leverage OIDC, and there you have a, a, essentially a microservice. Did talk about dockerizing uPortal. Uh, the advantage there, I've seen this in, in a recent, um, development effort is that you know that the environment is set up for uPortal. It's configured exactly the same way. You can tear it down, remove that Docker image, and then come back, load it back up, and you're in the exact same environment. If there's a bug there, it's very likely, or I should say, if it's working well in your dev environment, copying that Docker image, um, you shouldn't see hardly any differences in test and production. The downside of Docker images is that, you know, if you need to make one little change, you can't just copy out a JSP file or one config file that's embedded inside of um, the Tomcat. For you portal, you'd have to uh, build another Docker image and copy that out. Um, but it's really, it, it's, it's very handy to have the confidence 
of here's this one file and it carries the whole portal for me into my next environment. I touched on customizing uPortal and went through um, the handful of configuration files that need to be updated when you create a custom uh, a module, which is how you get custom Java code into your uPortal or your, your portlets. Uh, and then again, we fell back to some on-site collaboration, but I think that night there was someone providing dinner, so we didn't stay too long. We definitely made um, an effort to have dinner with our colleagues from the other projects. Uh, and then kind of wrapping up Wednesday, it was a half day. We talked about the roadmap. This was more just a discussion and I'll, and I'll um, touch on the roadmap later on. Uh, we talked about integrations, automation, and tooling. Essentially there, it was more of kind of a, a wish list. And then we had some issues with um, our reservations of our conference room. So we kind of kind of rushed through a lot of these things. We talked about open Aperio, and Chris will um, will dig, dive into that here shortly. And then again, we wrapped up with on-site collaboration. We actually spent the most time that day on, on collaborating. Um, I went a little long, but I want to touch real quick on the dev days for 2019. That happened at um, Gilbert, Arizona, there at the Unicon offices. Uh, we covered a lot of things. That one was more of an unconference style where we threw topics up on the board in the mornings, voted on you know who wants to hear or you know what was the most popular topic to cover, ranked it that way, and then dove in for an hour or two on each topic. This um, Dev Days in 2020, I had prepared slides for all these topics, so it was more of a, like a mini conference. But I will say the one really cool thing about 2019 was that uh, I've been to a lot of conferences, I've been through um, some of these workshops, and there always seems to be one or two people who cannot complain, complete the workshop. Either they weren't able to um, install something correctly, uh, their computer was acting up, or they just, um, you know, there's some some step they missed or did wrong and, and kind of, um, you know, prevented them from completing the, the workshop. In the 2019 one, we went through a document and uh, created a web component from scratch a hello world, brought it into uPortal, and out of the 15 attendees, all 15 were able to complete that, which was pretty neat, pretty amazing. So just thought I'd throw that out there. All right, I'm done. I need to take a breath. All right, thank you, Benito. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and cover some highlights from the Open Aperio conference this year. Next slide, please. Uh, so we had two kind of state of the projects, uh, two case studies, and then we had a, a bit of a technical discussion. Um, so you, um, Open Apero this year uh, had changed the format even before the COVID-19 concerns happened. Uh, they were considering doing uh, single track presentations. Uh, so the wider Aperio community can go ahead and get an idea of what everyone else is doing, right? Because in years past, you know, people would kind of go on the uPortal track or the Sakai track, and they wouldn't really see a lot of other presentations. Um, and so for the first two days, it was this, um, in the mornings, it was this single track. I kind of give an overview of what's going on in your uh, project, uh, a little bit of a, an overview of what it is and next steps. And so we had a state of uPortal um, and that was a recorded session. Jim Helwig uh, led the charge to put that together, and then there was help from Julian, Benito, and Laura. Um, they gave a, a solid overview and um, kind of why you would want to use uPortal uh, to the wider community. So that was, that was good to hear and, and know that um, a lot more ears were listening than you usually had. Uh, the next um, and final um, kind of state of the application was uh, Duncan McGrewer from the University of Edinburgh um, jumped on and talked about Fios and kind of where they're at with their system um, and kind of what they see for the community. Um, Fiosin is a very young application. It has some um, some really useful features.
features to it um, to be able to kind of centralize notifications. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of see that if you go with the eyes of or the ears that it, it is younger, um, but what, what does it have to offer? And, and Duncan, I thought, did, did a good job in, um, in kind of displaying that to the community. Um, for our first case study, uh, we went through the University of Edinburgh's uPortal instance. Uh, Duncan again led that um, and was able to talk through kind of the at the business point of view uh, or at the business level uh, why they wanted uPortal, some of the difficulties they've had, uh, lessons learned, and those kind of things. The goal was not a, a technical deep dive, but as someone who has never seen uPortal before, um, you would still be able to you know, appreciate the discussion. Next slide, please. So in a similar vein, um, then Duncan also went through uh, the Fileson um, instance that they run as a case study. Um, and then we brought in um, some of the community notes that we've had on Fileson as well. So Fileson um, is, um, is in, um, installed or integrated with two uPortal instances. It is its own application. Um, it's its own uPortal project, but since it is um, currently only integrated with uPortal, uh, that's why we've included it here, and um, we were touching it closely on uPortal as well. Uh, for the final presentation that uh, talked about uPortal, it got a little more technical, but the goal was not uh, too much into the weeds. Uh, just talking about how straightforward it can be to customize uPortal, right? Uh, if, if adopters' needs are really not, you know, if you're, if you're happy with the three-column model, that's fine, right? Um, but you shouldn't feel concerned or stressed out about uh, really customizing it to um, to kind of your look and feel of your institution. Uh, so we leaned on uh, Benito's blog post that he wrote a while back. Uh, it's a four-part series, I believe, uh, that kind of goes through the best practices of of why things are kind of set up the way they are in uPortal with uPortal Start and how you can extend it. Some overall impressions from the conference. Um, I, I feel that the online forum was challenging for community engagement, right? I mean, and that's not a huge surprise, um, but I saw that people would, we had a, a fair number of attendees in the sessions, um, or in the various sessions, uh, which I thought that was, you know, that was a positive thing, um, but then there was not a lot of discussion, um, you know, not a lot of questions afterwards. Um, and so I think just that online form made it difficult for folks. Um, I feel that the single track um, that happened Monday and Tuesday morning um, was a good thing. Um, it helped people see, you know, I understood a little bit more about what other Aperio applications did, um, and we were able to get a lot more eyes on uPortal and Fileson. So if someone was out there looking for a dashboard, um, you know, hopefully they're in the right place at the right time and we're able to listen in. And the other thing that we tried to do, and I, um, and I, I felt this was, and you know, as we were going through it was a good, um, was a good strategy, if you will. We were trying to decide, you know, who's our audience going to be at Open Aperio? Um, and so we chose to do case studies over technical discussions uh, to, to work on getting folks that um, are either new adopters or they're just looking for a portal um, interested in what other people have done. Right? And we didn't go into you know, the deep weeds on customizing you know, a login um, controller or whatnot uh, because that's, that's very specific and we felt that the wide majority of people that may attend the uPortal discussions um, would really, you know, frankly, not care about that at this point. They want to know what other people have done, why they did it, and some of the lessons learned. Um, and so with our case studies, um, I felt that we were able to achieve that goal. Next slide, please. I'll hand it over to Benito. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, one thing on on the single track for Monday and Tuesday at Open Aperio, could you describe what that single track um, kind of covered? It it aimed to cover every application that is inside of Aperio. Of yeah, inside of Aperio. So you had BD Work, Unitime, Open Aquella, UPortal, 
Kaz, and they all we were all given 20 minutes, and I don't even know if there was time for questions. Uh, they kept it on a very tight schedule uh, to be able to get all the applications um, presented on. Okay, great. Um, okay, moving on to uh, our, our next item, COVID-19 and U-Portal. Um, <clears throat> So this section, we're combining just three topics that have percolated up over the last several months. There was one community call on June 19th uh, that, that covered this topic, and, and it also um, includes some feedback I've had from clients and community members. So the first thing, next slide, yep, uh, is a, a lot of, of implementers have leveraged notifications. So they set up you know, alerts, these banners that pop up and uh, direct their users to go to uh, another website or page where there was the latest updates on the coronavirus, um, which is great. I mean, that's what the portal does is it has the ability to potentially reach a lot of users and get them timely information right away. So it's great to hear that a majority of portal implementer, like several of them, um, leverage this quickly or able to, to provide this uh, for their community. Uh, another thing, and I, I heard this from Oakland, they provided some screenshots in the uh, community call, but I've also heard from other universities and even talked to a uh, potential client who is looking for this particular feature, not a portal, but they wanted some health screening um, apps. Uh, the idea that uh, users would go through a couple or a small questionnaire and um, you know, based on, on their answers would be directed to you know, stay off campus or um, go through a more uh, detailed check as they come on campus or go through some other means. Um, uh, it, in, in today, you know, <laughs> today's world, it seems like uh, just getting this kind of basic information really helps um, because there really is a dearth of, of information. So the more, the more we know about our cohorts, the better. Next slide. Um, and, and then the other thing that really stood out talking to several implementers was the fact that portals are, are generally um, configured for heavy traffic, especially at certain times of, of the year, the semester, you know, registration for week of class, a lot of portals uh, see a huge amount of traffic and then they dip back down. Well, thanks to, to that scenario that's, that's commonplace, a lot of implementers were able to easily configure uPortal if they even needed any changes. They were able to handle the traffic as opposed to um, you know, other services. Uh, this, this is a time where IT folk were expected, you know, and they're already stretched at universities. They were expected to step up, improve all their services, add new services, all within very short time frames. So having a service like uPortal that's stable and one less thing to worry about and, or if they did have issues and they needed some assistance, you know, obviously we, we came in and were able to help and a lot of people had a few hours here and there or engagements. Um, so things went well um, and that was, that was fantastic to hear. Um, and, and on we go to web components. Chris? Thank you. Next slide, please. So since it's been several uh, quarters since we had the last briefing, um, you know, web components have been talked about a lot, um, but we wanted to kind of follow up on that and just, if folks have not um, caught the vision of web components, we wanted to kind of drive that home. And hopefully you've already seen this before, um, and if so, then, you know, the messaging is working. Um, but for you, Portal, web components can bring essentially a modern widget library to enhance your presence in your institution. Uh, next slide. When you're looking at 
saying, well, how do I how do I create a web component? I mean, that sounds great, and I you know I get the basic idea, but how do I go ahead and implement it? It's essentially four basic steps. Um, and due to time, I won't go ahead and uh, read through all of this. Um, but essentially, you find your web component, or you can create it. Uh, we'll talk about the web components that are already available. You add it to your uPortal resource server. You wrap it in a simple portlet definition file. Um, and then you add it to your layout, and you're up and running. Um, and then you're able to leverage known working widgets that really add a lot of um, kind of spice, if you will, or flavor to your, your, um, your users um, in a very short amount of time. Next page. Uh, so these are the, the community or the web components that are available from the uPortal community. They're known to work well with uPortal. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of other web components out there. Um, and there's, there's nothing that's stopping anyone from going ahead and, and adding um, other web components into their uPortal instance. These have just been created specifically for uPortal. Uh, you'll notice that there's the color coding on it. Uh, the green uh, web components um, are all part of one repository, and they were the initial. They were part of the initial repository of web components. And as they were, the web components were being built out, um, it was realized that it would be better to uh, separate web components by their primary function. And so, like you'll notice, the four notification web components; those are all in a different repository. Um, so if you are, you know, we don't have time to go through each one of these, um, but if you're interested in what they might do, uh, there's a bunch of documentation out there on uPortal Contrib um, that can dig further into any of these. Next slide. Um, for the sake of time, we will, um, but also of interest, we'll just touch on a couple on, you know, when you see this in a portal, it's like, oh, that that's a web component. Um, and how you might be able to quickly add something into your um, your uPortal instance. So on the left-hand side, you have that notification bell, and then you have the notification um, pop-up that gives you the ten uh, you know, your ten most recent notifications. And that was all built with a web component, the notification icon. Um, with web components, it's it's the front-end experience. You still need. Uh, an API or a set of services to provide the you know the, the actual information that you want to present to the user, and then on the right hand side you have the modal that um, that'll get it into your user's face that's saying you know you know you need to look at this and you, you really need to click a button in order to get through so you're making sure that your users are seeing the notification you're presenting. Next slide. Moving on to a, a kind of a different. Uh, notification type, right? So for layouts, uh, there's a dashboard carousel out there that instead of having to scroll through a long list, possibly a long list of portlets, you're able to sort it by type, as you see down at the bottom, those three buttons. And then you have each of these content areas that generally when you see um, a carousel, they're, they're like images, right? And you can scroll through your images. So these are, um, each of these um, boxes actually contain a portlet. And so um, portlets can also just contain a web component. You can nest web components. So there's a lot of possibilities that you can do with just adding a dashboard carousel um, and, um, and being able to collapse the space that your portlets are presented in. Next slide. Um, the the ESCO content grid uh, we talked a little bit about that in the um, in the layout example, um, but it adds a much cleaner look um, to the to the grid view of uPortal, um, and then the waffle menu that's a that's a pretty standard thing out there in the um, user experience of the web now, um, and now uPortal has one that is you know is a known working solution with um, with the application. Next slide. Thank you. The last web component that we'll talk about is Form Builder. Um, it's, it's highly extensible. It allows dynamic um, input forms right, um, in HTML, driven by JSON schema uh, and backed by the Form Builder microservices. So you essentially take a, uh, a JSON configuration file, and you're able to then present it to your user as validation in it. And then when you click Submit, 
um, it will create a submission record in JSON and the FBMS service will store that in the database and um, FBMS is also extensible uh, to add a variety of filters to get some pretty crazy business logic going in there uh, to really ma meet the needs that you have as a as an institution without having to worry about uh, you know all of the kind of boilerplate coding just to get forms to be presented on the page. All right, we'll hand it over to Benito for roadmap. Sure, thanks. Um, so. We're going to cover what we have discussed um, since Dev Days and after the Open Aperio conference and a little bit in the uPortal steering committee uh, calls. So next slide. Kind of one of the first things that, ha um, that, that has been prioritized is the idea that we're stuck on Java 8 and that doesn't have a good image. There are other applications out there, enterprise level applications that are using even older versions of Java, but we don't, we don't want to be in that group. Uh, there, there are some technical issues that have come up uh, around libraries and particular code. It's not that anything's been um, coded incorrectly in portal that's causing issues. It's just tracking down all these little corner cases and making sure everything is running uh, smoothly. Um, uPortal code is already leveraging some of the newer features of uh, Java 8 around streaming and, and some of the um, functional um, improvements, but we really want to get it up to Java 14. There, there's new versions of Java coming out on a regular basis, and we just want to stay current so that way we can implement um, some of the, the new features when it, it fits uh, the code. Next. So kind of a, a second thing, a second priority is updating portlets or rewriting them as web components. And, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly the... Uh, the embracing of web components, um, but that takes a little bit more effort. But as we review some of the portlets, of course, we've seen that dependencies are, are, are falling behind. So we need to focus on, on getting those dependencies up to the latest versions um, and also doing a little bit of cleanup and, and sometimes a lot of cleanup. Some of the front ends just really seem dated and don't meet the um, expectations of the modern user. Uh, you know, they were novelty back when they were first created years and years ago, uh, but we, we just um, really don't want to see a lot of novelty anymore. We want to see a cohesive user experience. Actually, I'm jumping into another, uh, um, another priority, but the idea is that we're going to look at portlets, we'll clean them up um, dependency-wise and look to see what needs to be rewritten as the web components. Next slide. Uh, and another important thing, those are the top three, has to do with Spring 5. We are currently running Spring 4. Uh, the Spring framework has so many modules to it. It's really allowed us to remove custom code. I remember back when uPortal had its own um, ground up code for accessing LDAP servers. Of course, Spring has um, a standardized library now around that. And, and there's just several areas where we saw a new module um, that was added to, to Spring framework, and we were able to remove some of our custom code. So we'd like to continue that trend and stay current. Um, one of the things that held us back from upgrading to the latest versions of Spring is that they decided the portlet technology is no longer viable. Uh, so they they dropped their portlet um, module. LifeRay is another standard portal project, and the developers there have decided to take the Spring 4 portlet module and make it compatible with Spring 5. And they've been kind enough to make that an open source project. So that's going to be uh, how we move forward with Spring 5. So we're kind of excited to move on that. Uh, the th the um, fourth item, so now we're getting into kind of the lower priorities, but 
the UI improvements, again, some of these UIs for the portlets are, are kind of dated. Um, there was a lot of experimentation back in the day and sometimes the best UI one, but sometimes it was the only UI and no one else wanted to tackle it. So that's, that's what we ended up with. So we really need to improve that, but more so underneath the visual aspect, there was a lot of um, experimentation with libraries, JavaScript libraries in particular. While we've uh, cleaned up code on the back end with Spring Framework, on the front end, there are several technologies that might get inserted in the portal page. Um, some of those are readily replaceable by modern libraries. Um, so that's a, an effort we're going to try to push for this next year or so, is to revamp those dependencies, try to reduce them, and modernize the UI in the process. OK, and then last slide for this section, um, the admin APIs and tool revamp. Here in particular, the, the admin tools are built into uPortal. They're not extend, external portlets. Um, some of them are portlets and some of them are, are just um, JSPs with um, servlets behind them. Uh, but there's been um, a, a, um, requests for the admin APIs or the admin tools to be revamped so that there's APIs that they, um, remote services may be able to do things as an admin and also the tools themselves, just as I, I pointed out in the previous slide, the UI could use some improvement. Um, some of them aren't bad at all. They're just different. So those will probably be secondary concerns, but there are a, a few such as the uh, groups administration portlet that really is challenging to use. You need to know um, kind of the design behind the code to really leverage that. And it shouldn't be that challenging. It should be more intuitive. So that is kind of our fifth priority. I, I, I hope we get to it, um, but uh, I think that might be something that would get carried over. But those are our, our top five uh, targets uh, for uPortal roadmap for the 2020 and 2021. All right, thank you, Benito. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of, you know, Unicon's efforts in the past several uh, quarters, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of smaller efforts that, that focus on the maintainability of the ecosystem. And so we just wanted to highlight three kind of topics in that area that you'll see kind of sprinkled throughout the ecosystem. Uh, Benita talked about uh, Semver, so that's now been uh, uh, more widely adopted. I've been working on uh, better documentation. Uh, there's still uh, more to do, uh, but the goal is that there's less digging in code when you're just trying to figure out how a feature works. Um, and then working on maintenance. Uh, maintenance is, you know, maybe not flashy. It doesn't necessarily give you any UI new features, um, but it's important for the health of the repositories in the ecosystem. So bug fixes, dependency upgrades, and the variety of chores um, all just helps to make sure that uPortal stays modern and, and ages well. Next slide. Uh, we wanted to cover, um, and, and due to time, it's going to have to be fairly brief, um, but several repositories that had notable features uh, that have been um, enhanced. So uPortal Start uh, now has uh, uh, the ability to be dockerized and, um, and allow uh, compressing of the Tomcat install files uh, so you can launch your uPortal instance and test and prod without having to use uPortal Start directly. Um, uPortal Start provides that strategy for localizing customizations. Uh, you're able to keep your um, like uPortal core, your bookmarks portlet, and uh, you know those code bases pristine and just pull in releases from external repositories like the, uh, like every other adopter is using and then you can go and customize it via the uPortal start framework. Um, we also have uh, some JMeter performance tests. They're kind of more of a proof of concept at this point, um, but you know as they get built out, then we'll be able to do more performance testing before the end users uh, do it for us, if you will. 
Um, also a note that when you are upgrading uPortal Start um, or are you upgrading uh, you know, the modules that uPortal Start controls, uh, you need to look at kind of with you know, Sember what is changing in the other dependencies. Um, uPortal Core had two modules removed, but uPortal Start depended on those. And so it was, you know, you can bump the version of uPortal and uPortal Start, but then you also had to make a change. Um, those are more rare, um, but still happen, so something for, you know, for you to be aware of. Uh, for the notifications portlet, it was enhanced to also now act as a notification servlet, right? So there's a difference between portlet and servlet as listed out there. Um, and then the notification portlet also now has OADC support. Next slide. A simple content portlet fixed a pretty big bug with data init. Um, it allows you now to another way to handle uh, different properties files. If you have to use the same properties file, you can now do so, but still target different environments. Um, and a simplified version of the simple content portlet um, was developed um, for web components, which essentially just takes away the WYSIWYG editor because that was trying to cut out the web component HTML tags uh, when you saved it through the UX. Uh, for announcements portlet, it now um, works well with the overrides context, so you portal start for customizations, uh, supports uh, the PNGs, it used to just not render them, um, and also has a performance enhancement uh, that uses a 30 second cache for your topics list. Um, and then the final repository, of course, you portal core, uh, a bunch of effort with the REST APIs, uh, so truly sessionless uh, through OIDC tokens. You can now clear caches, gather you know, permissions by which username or by a username. You can do type-based searching, either portlets or people, um, and then you can access what's in your portlet registry all through your REST APIs. Uh, more work on authentication with the JWT configuration. Uh, there was a regression in U Portal from U Portal 4 to U Portal 5. Uh, where Smart LDAP didn't work, and so that's been restored. Um, Lucene was added as the search engine, um, so you now get index um, index searching and also ranked search results with that, and then just the power of Lucene behind that. Um, and then several login enhancements, um, deeper ability to customize your business logic and login and that kind of stuff. Next slide. I just want to um, add a little bit to the sustained engineering update. Um, the, this was a focus on enhancements and, and new features. Uh, there were a significant amount of bug fixes, not just on these five highlighted um, repos, but on uh, a vast majority of the repos, um, almost all of the, the popular ones. Um, I think the only ones that weren't uh, touched were like the test portlet, um, and, and I think there's two or three test portlets, so those really didn't require um, too much effort. Uh, so, but these were just the highlights of, of new features. There's a bunch of bug fixes, and um, you know, but all that can be checked in GitHub uh, to see what's been changed with the release notes. Uh, back one more slide. Just to sum up, you know, we just uh, really have found web components have taken the portal to a whole new level. And the effort in uPortal 5 to break from keeping all the raw code and compile everything, that's the, the way uPortal 4 was, to having these binaries that you get pulled into to uPortal start and all uPortal start is really doing is capturing your configuration, your skins and any customizations um, really allows uh, for faster deployments and, and a brighter future. Uh, Chris, you wanna add anything? No, oh, I think that sums it up well. Okay. All right, well. There was a lot of information packed into a short amount of time. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions that they want to ask, if anything kind of popped in your head as we went along. Um, 
we were kind of monitoring chat, didn't see anything pop in there. So if anybody has anything that they want us to cover in the last few minutes here, feel free to go ahead and jump in. And if not, it's okay too, but. And then just for uh, anyone who might be watching this recording after this has been done, uh, if you have any questions that come up after you listen to this that you'd like to address to us, feel free to go ahead and uh, shoot us an email um, as our emails are down here at the bottom of the Q&A section. Um, so feel free to shoot us an email if you have any questions that we might be able to answer for you regarding anything that you've heard about today. Cool. Awesome. Well, Benito, you did such an, you and Chris did such an awesome job that nobody has any questions whatsoever. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who jumped on today. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to get in here and, and listen to the information that we found that we want to present to you today. Uh, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out and uh, we look forward to talking to you guys next time. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, folks.